Right, right. All right. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Ricardo and I will be your facilitator for this chapter uh, three of the introduction to statistical learning using the Python language. Uh, these are the many objectives that I copied from the other you know, book club that deals with the same formation, but in, in R. And as you can see, the main topics, apart from the learning objectives that are, you know, uh, uh, nicely, uh, uh, you know, nicely set. Uh, what we're talking here is about three main topics. So the first three bullet points uh, refer to the model when we use a single, a, a single, a single variable, single predictor, uh, linear, linear regression. Okay. Then we then are going to talk about the model adding more than one uh, predictor, more than one uh, 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 independent variable. And then the last two before, uh, the last one that, that's, that deals about comparing uh, and cost linear regression with k and regression is more like comparison with a non-parametric. Uh, uh, algorithm, okay? So uh, it's just, you know, like a, like a nice, you know, comparison between uh, parametric, which is ordinary regression, and then the, the KNN. But the third one is when we test the assumptions for the model. And one of the things that we're going to be seeing is that uh, the linear regression model has multiple assumptions, all right? So I stole also from my previous uh, uh, dissertation on, on this chapter, you know, doing the, the book club. I found this very interesting, okay? And this is kind of a meme, right? And what it says is that when you advertise, right? Uh, you talk about artificial intelligence, AI. When you hire, you talk about machine learning, but when you implement it, it's linear regression. And the, the message here is that even though there are more advanced uh, algorithms and models that you can apply to a, you know, to a, to a set of data, eventually your linear regression, if, it, if it's a, if it's a, a model that, 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 that fits the, you know, the, uh, that, that fits the data, um, the linear regression is going to be one of your baselines or traditional models that you need uh, to uh, to implement in order to understand better what is the relationship between those predictors and your response or your dependent uh, variable okay so I was I always find this one very insightful okay so let's start discussing uh, more of the you know the, the notes on this uh, on this chapter. Okay, so the first thing that the authors uh, present us is, and I'm going to see if I can do this, okay? Let me show you, okay. This is from chapter two. This, uh, let me see if I can get it right here. Okay, okay. So from chapter two, uh, we were introduced uh, this data set that, that is called advertising, okay? And it's in the package on the, on the library of the IS, ISLP. And in this one, uh, this uh, data set is very uh, concise. It just has four variables, four columns. You have the, uh, the, the, the expenditure, on TV advertising in, in thousands, then the radio advertising, the newspaper, and the sales, okay? So what we want to uh, study or to try to understand is what is the relationship between our expenditure in this, uh, you know, media uh, segments and how do they relate to sales? So this chapter, chapter three, 
starts with a couple of questions that relate to this uh, particular you know, set, set, of, set of data. And one of the things that we can see is that depending on the media, right? Depending if it's the expenditure on the newspaper or the expenditure on the radio or the expenditure on, on the TV uh, segment, so we have different behaviors, right? You know, if you are seeing that line, that, you know, that line basically is the, that, that regression line that fits, is the best fit between the, the predictor and the, and the response, the sales. And one of the things that we can observe is that even though all of them have some kind of relationship, why? Right? Because, you know, you see that it's not an horizontal line. If it was an horizontal line, the slope will be zero and there really won't be no really relationship in terms of real linear relationship with the, with the response. But you see that there is, in some ways, there's less, you know, inclination and more inclination in some, some other uh, variables. So that we can see just by visualizing this plot that there's some kind of relationship. Okay, sometimes stronger in one, in one segment, TV, for example, it seems like they have a stronger relationship because that slope is kind of, you know, a little bit more tilted, you know, vertically. And then we have newspaper, which is more, the slope is kind of more relaxed, okay? So given that uh, set of facts, uh, do you think, and this is something that, you know, we we want to uh, we want to discuss. Do you think that a linear regression could be a model that could give us a good understanding on the sales of that media that is going to be producing? All right, um, that's one question that we need to we, we need to understand and we need to answer. All right, okay. So, given and we're going to go back to this, uh, you know, to this uh, uh, questions, you know, later with some other understanding that we're going to be gathering. So this is the the model for a linear, a simple linear regression. What is called the OLS, ordinary real regression. And what you have here is a Y, which is the response variable. Y in in terms of the advertising that will be the sales. And it's going to be approximately modeled by, those are the uh, quickly lines, right? That you see after the Y. It's going to be approximately modeled by this equation, which is going to be beta naught, which is the intercept or, or the constant, plus a, a beta one, which is going to be the slope or the estimate for the, the, the predictor which in, in this case is X, all right? So once we have that, you know, uh, model, then what we're going to get when we do, you know, the, the formula and the equations is that we're going to get some estimates, right? Those uh, hats are in, indicative or an X estimate of the true, uh, the true uh, coefficients, okay? so. In this case, beta not hat is going to be an approximation or an estimate of the real beta not. And the same thing with the beta one, all right? And you're going to have the X, the X is, is a fact, it's going to be a, a, you know, we're not going to estimate because that's the observed value. But then in the Y, we're going to have also a hat. So the Y, giving us the results of that equation is going to be also an, a, an approximation of the true value of y, okay? So going back to our visuals, right? And this is the same plot for the TV advertising uh, and then the sales uh, are results, okay? And we model this and we saw this as plot already in chapter two. But now we can understand more or less what is the underlying uh, uh, equation of that uh, linear regression, okay? 
And as you can see, all these uh, red dots are the X values. And the Y is going to be presented by this line, OK? This blue line, which is the regression line. And those are going to be the Y hats, the Y hats. And just to give, up, give you some more information, the difference right between the y hats and the uh, and, and the and, and the observed values is going to be the residuals, okay? The errors that we're going to be getting from this model, okay? So going a little bit to the math. So those residuals, if we want to understand if this is the line that best fits this you know this interaction between tv and sale and sales one of the methods that we can use is compute the residual sum of squares and why do we square uh those uh you know those residual those errors is because we want all the all the errors in a positive you know uh, magnitude okay so as you can see there are some errors that are you know, going to one side and there are others that are going to the other side. One of them are positive and the other one are negative. When you square them, then all those values are going to be positive and then you can add them all. So that's going to be the residual sum of squares. And if we substitute this error, right? Okay, using this equation, this error is equivalent, right? To the Y1, of the first observation minus the beta zero hat, the estimate of beta zero, the intercept, minus the beta one, the slope, okay, associated with our first uh, observation, okay, and then square. So we're going to substitute this formula right here, uh, here with the errors, okay, and that's going to be the same, our residual sum of squares. If you do some linear algebra and using some calculus to calculate the minimum, okay, what is the minimum value for beta hat zero and beta hat one that gives me the minimum residual sum of squares? The result are going to be these equations, okay? And this equation is for the beta one hat and for the beta not hat that has that line is the uh, the best fit, the best line that is fitted to minimize those uh, residual sum of squares. Okay. Any comments or any questions so far? Good. Okay, good. So, when we try to visualize that fit, remember that we are just dealing with a predictor, right? And a response. So it's easy to visualize graphically, you know, this model. And if you uh, look at the, at the, at the right uh, image, you will see that you have beta zero in one dimension, beta one in another dimension, and the uh, RSS, the result of sum of squares, which is the really the, the function that we're trying to minimize. Okay. And you see that that dot, that red dot is the minimum, a value of all the possible values that you could get for beta naught and beta one. That is the point where there's a minimum. Okay. And there's going to be a beta zero, beta naught, and a beta one associated with that dot. And that's going to give us the parameters for the best fit for our linear uh, regression. OK. OK, so now, now that we understand better uh, that formula, we're going to add the, the errors, right? Because you know we're already familiar with beta 0 plus beta 1x, that's our linear regression, plus the errors. So to calculate some kind of metric that can give us a sense of, uh, you know, a sense of uh, uh, goodness of fit or lack of fit, 
we're going to calculate another metric, which is RSE, which is the residual standard error. And this one is going to be calculated and it's an estimate of the variance of, the, of that line, okay? Of that regression line. The residual standard error is going to be calculated by the residual sum of squares divided by N minus two, okay? N will be the number of uh, observations that we have minus two, and that's going to be equal to then to the uh, residual standard error, okay? So why do we want to calculate that? Well, one of the reasons that we can want to calculate that RSC, apart from getting a sense of how well uh, our model is, you know, um, our model is trying to fit, you know, that, uh, that equation. Also, it gives us the opportunity to calculate some uh, confidence intervals, okay? And the confidence intervals for beta uh, hat one and beta hat zero is going to be given by these equations, okay? And for example, for beta one, if we want to get a 95% confidence interval, okay? In other words, as there's going to be a 95% probability that the real beta one is going to be uh, included within that range between the beta one hat and two of the standard errors for the beta one hat, okay? And that comes because of the Gaussian, right? The Gaussian uh, uh, distribution or, or, or traditionally called the normal distribution, which within two, uh, two minus two or plus two uh, variances, you get a 95% of the area of the curve, all right? So to calculate that, okay, to calculate that, you're going to calculate this number, RSE, and then with these formulas, then you're going to get those uh, uh, confidence intervals. And in this case, because it's uh, plus or minus two, it's going to be a 95%. If you want to get, let's say, a 99%, 99.97%, then that two is going to be then three, all right? But usually 95% confidence interval, according to our uh, statistical friends, is the, the most you know, traditional one, all right? Okay, so and now that we know a little bit about the res residual standard error, which is a measure, or what they they say that it's a measure of the lack of fit, because there's going to be some kind of error that is going to permeate within that regression line. There's another statistic that this one is kind of uh, more uh, more popular. Okay, it's called the R square, or the coefficient of determination, and the R square is going to be a measure of the proportion of the variance explained by the model, all right? So the R square is going to be calculated by one minus the residual sum of squares by, divided by the total sum of squares. And as you can see, usually those ranges are going to be from zero to one. So for example, if we have an R square of one, that means that the model can explain 100% the variance, you know, between the predictor and the response, all right? If the R square is zero, that means that the model is not explaining anything, okay? That there's no, there's no proportion that is explaining. So in other words, it's a bad fit. It's not, it's not a good fit, it's a bad fit. Okay, so question for the audience. Can that R square be negative? What do you think? No. Okay. Uh, who said no? <laughs> I also said no, it can't be negative. <laughs> okay, who, 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 who said it? Me, Lydia. <laughs> oh, Lydia, Lydia. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, uh, usually, usually, uh, yeah, th this question can, can be tricky, and you can, you, you can uh, Google it. Okay, uh, you know, just Google it, you know, can R square be negative? 
And there's a possibility that the R square is negative when this number, RSS, the, the residual sum of squares, is greater than the total sum of squares, okay? There could be uh, uh, occasions that that could happen. The interpretation is that, imagine if zero is a bad fit, imagine a negative R square, okay? It's probably a worse fit, right? Okay, it's, it's, it's not that it's not a bad fit, it's, it's a worse fit. So there could be uh, instances where R square can be negative. And that's a, a, a really uh, red flag on your model. In other words, your model is not, it's not explaining, it's not zero, it's not explaining anything, okay? About the relationship between the, uh, the response and the, you know, the, 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 the independent variables and the, and the response variables, okay? So uh, check it out because uh, that one came in one of the, one of the quizzes, you know, uh, in, 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 the, in the Coursera course, and there was some discussion about it, okay? So that's all that, that I can tell you from the book about simple linear regression. Now we're going to, you know, go to the next level, and we're going to add uh, predictors, okay? So instead of a simple linear regression that we had only one predictor, now we're going to have more than one. But the main you know, algebra, the main formulas, they still hold. The only thing that they get a little bit more complicated, okay? So uh, one of the things that you are going to see in the multiple linear regression is that there is a, there is a phenomenon that two or more predictors could be very closely related to one another, okay? Uh, usually, we want predictors that are closely related to the response to the Y. But in the multiple linear regression, you could have some predictors that are highly correlated between themselves. And this is called multicollinearity, okay? The issue of multicollinearity. And we're going to, you know, be seeing, you know, how, you know, we can deal with it. But that's one thing that is, you know, very particular, peculiar with multiple linear regression that you don't see in the simple linear regression. Okay. So, for example, uh, remember the advertising uh, data set, right? You know, fitting the sales, fitting it with uh, TV uh, uh, only. Uh, fitting in with uh, newspaper uh, ex expenditure only or fitting it with radio. So now we're going to see when we combine those three, you know, what is going to be the effect on Y and also on those metrics, okay? Another um, difference uh, between simple, right? Simple and multiple linear regression is that there is new statistics that you should be aware. And for example, one of the statistics that we uh, uh, can test if the model benefits from those predictors is what is called the F statistic, okay? So if the F statistic is close to one, that means that the predictors that we're adding you know, to the, to, the, to the equation, they are not significant, all right? You know, because it's testing basically the constant. So the further that you get, you know, greater than one for the F statistic, the more significant that model is going to be. And this is the equation for that F statistic. And you see it, you know, if you if you run it in, in stats models in Python, which is analog to the summary in R, you will see at the end, you will see uh, F statistic and you know, the number of the statistic and the p-value. The greater the number, the more uh, significant uh, your model is when you are adding those predictors, okay? Now, let's go back to the R square, right? Coefficient of determination, proportion uh, of variance explained. Okay, now, instead of only one predictor, now we have more than one predictor. And this is going to be, right? the equation for when you are adding more predictors. 
one thing that you should be aware is that the R square, the R square, if you add, if you are, if you keep continue adding predictors to that formula, it's going to, you know, it's going to be the same as, you know, the R square is going to be the same as before without adding those predictors, or it's going to increase. Okay, so that's one of the weakness that we observe in a square when we're dealing with multiple linear regression. Okay, so the way to fix that, to fix that behavior, their square is to then do an adjustment. And the adjustment is to include the P, okay? The number of predictors. So as you, as you uh, increase the number of predictors, because this is a denominator, right? Uh, the denominator is going to be increasing and then your uh, R square is going to be decreasing. It's going to be opposite proportional to the R square. And that's the adjustment that you need to do to the R square in the multiple linear regression to not, you know, get full, right? Or get the illusion that because I'm adding new predictors, uh, the model is explaining the variance uh, uh, better, okay? Okay, so uh, that's basically it about multiple linear regression. And we will see it uh, in the some of the exercises. We can see the, the difference in R square and adjusted R square when we add one predictor. Let's say that we are doing the advertising and we're doing a base model of TV and radio to explain the sales. So what happens when we add newspaper? Do our scare increase or stay the same or decreases, right? You know, that could be one question that we're going to have. And then the adjusted R square, is it increasing or decreasing? And you'll see that the R square is going to be the same or increase. And then the adjusted R square usually is going to be decreasing because of that adjustment in the number of predictors, all right? Okay, any questions so far? Good. One question. Uh -huh. When we are, when we are uh, subtracting not only P to N, but P minus one, well, P plus mm -hmm. one, uh, right. do you know if that has to do with the, with the same concept that comes in when we are talking about sample standard deviation and we use N minus one instead of N? I think it had to do with uh, unbiased parameters or something. I, I don't quite remember the name. Uh, I believe it's, it has to do with degrees of freedom, okay, in the in the formula. You know that uh, there's a concept in statistics about degrees of freedom, and usually what happens is that the constant is, you know, one one parameter that you cannot, you know, that the, it doesn't have the freedom, you know, to fluctuate, okay, the, the constant. There could be other parameters, but I think that one, the, that, that n minus one, it refers, and we can check it out, but it refers to the degrees of freedom. Like n minus two in the formula of the residual standard error, uh, n minus two, that two refers to uh, two degrees of freedom. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, but yeah, but the, 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 the interesting thing here is that the R square usually, the R square usually doesn't have that P. Okay, that P is added to adjust that R square. So it doesn't behave like I was telling you that you can keep adding predictors, right, to a model. Maybe they are not highly significant, but then your R square stays the same or goes up. And that's something that you should, you know, uh, you should you should keep in mind. Okay. Okay. So right now we have been talking about the that advertising, right? The uh, data set. Uh, to explain some of the uh, mechanics of the simple linear regression and the multiple linear regression. Okay. And those uh, predictors are uh, continuous, uh, uh, numerical, in other words, numerical. What happens when we introduce uh, qualitative uh, predictors, in other words, uh, labels? Okay. Let's say that we want to introduce. Uh, uh, let's say uh, gender, for example. Well, gender, okay, and 
we don't have to get into the weeds, but well, let, let's say that gender, we're going to define it as female and male. So here, we're going to have to transform that, uh, that variable into a numeric equivalent, okay? So one of the things that you are going to have to do in Python, okay, especially when you're using scikit-learn, is that you have to create some dummy variables, okay? So for example, in the gender, which is a binary, uh, you know, uh, uh, predictor, it, it can be only female or male, you know, in, in our, you know, in our assumption, uh, you can have female, let's say as one and male as zero, okay? So you're going to have, you are going to transform that variable, the qual qualitative variable into a numeric one, okay? With zeros and ones. What happens when there's more than two labels, okay? In this case, let's say in the advertising, let's say that we want to add the region, okay, where we are spending. Let's say that we divided the, the country, right? The country, we divided in north, south, uh, and east and west. Let's say that we have four labels, okay? North, south, east, east and west. So what is going to happen is that then we cannot change that variable unless it has some order, we cannot change it to a single column. Usually what is going to happen is that we have to create dummy variables that are going to be the same as the labels. So for example, if we have North, South, East, and West, we are going to transform that qualitative predictor, we are going to transform it into a column called North with when it was it was it was a north label, it's going to have a one, and if it's another label, it's going to have a zero, and then you're going to have a south column, where south is going to be activated when it, the label was south, and not activated when it, 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 it is it's not south, and so on. One of the things that you should be aware, and is this issue of multicollinearity, when you do that dummy variable, you know where all the labels have an independent column, uh, you are creating already, uh, you know, uh, a multicollinearity situation within those variables. So one of the things that you can do, and this is where the one hot encoding uh, technique, uh, you know, comes in, is that instead of transforming all the labels, you are going to have one label that is not going to be present as a column, okay? It's going to be present in the coding. So for example, let's say that we have North, South, East, and West. And North is going to be our base, right? The level zero baseline, right? So when North appears, it doesn't have a column. The columns are going to be South, East, and West, but then in that coding is going to be zero, 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 okay? So zero, 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 in that particular uh, coding is going to be represented as north. Then south is going to be activated when south is present, and then you know when it's not present, it's zero, and so forth. And that minimizes the issue of the multicollinearity in your you know in in in, in your formula. All right. So well, that's one of the things that you have to be present for the qualitative uh, predictors that you have to transform it to numerical. If you have a binary, you just have to transform those labels into numbers, usually zeros and ones. And then if you have more than, than two labels, then you should use the one hot hot encoding for this particular models, for the linear and multiple, multiple linear regression models, okay? To avoid the issue of multicollinearity, okay? And of course, because you are creating new features, you are going to have uh, your estimates, okay, according to those new features. So you're going to be adding new predictors to your model when you are transforming those qualitative uh, variables, okay? And I know that uh, this is more, uh, more palpable, more visual when we do the exercises. And you'll see, you know, when you do the exercises, how the, and especially in stats models, 
how one of the predictors, for example, if 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 we had that region of north, uh, south, east, and west, one of those labels is not going to be present in the in the summary of the of the coefficients. Okay, so that predictor is going to be the baseline, and it's going to basically is going to be zero. Okay, the estimate. The other ones are going to be relative to that base. Okay. Question so far. <laughs> ah. Ah, uh, correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Monica says it came well because the domain variable trap. Yes. Uh, what we're trying to avoid here is the multicollinearity uh, issue in the in the multiple uh, linear regression model. Okay, so there are other ways that we can, you know, add more uh, more power, more power to our models. One of them is, for example, interactions. So in this one, we're going to combine two predictors. Okay, we're going to combine two predictors and see if that interaction uh, helps, right, or improves the, the model performance or the model accuracy or minimizes uh, the, the residual sum of squares. And the way you can do it is, for example, you have x1, you have x2, and then add an interaction, x1 uh, uh, multiplied by x2. And that will be your interaction between those two uh, uh, predictors. The other way is, and this is something also, you know, that is, that is done, uh, is done uh, commonly, is that for nonlinear relationships, let's say that, uh, remembering the auto, auto data set that we saw in, in chapter two, in the exercises, uh, there was a graph, a plot, between horsepower and uh, miles per gallon, right? And miles per gallon is the response. And you could see that even though you can trace a line, the best fit for the line for those, you know, for those, for that relationship, uh, usually you can see that there could be a better fit if the line had a curve, all right? So you can introduce that curvilinear uh, model using polynomial fits. And what you're doing is just extending that predictor instead of doing an interaction, adding that predictor, but with a power, okay? The power of two, power of three, quadratic, cubic, uh, you know, power to the fourth, et cetera. And you can do that, you know, with the, with the, with the coding, you can do it. Uh, for example, in ARA, I remember that it's poly, uh, the, the function that gives you all these uh, nominals. We'll see in stats models, uh, I don't remember if poly or whatever, but in stats model also, there's a way to add this uh, a polynomial uh, fits to try to get a better uh, a, a better metric for, for your model, okay? All right, so. Scandal, thank uh -huh. you. Yeah, go okay. ahead. So when you were talking about uh, the multi-collinearity problem. Though mm -hmm. I know in modeling, yeah. at times we do not take that into concern, but I want to like ask, when do we use uh, the VIF, the, like the variance inflation factor? When uh, do that's, we, can we? That, that's coming, that's coming. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the variance inflation factor is a measure of how uh, collinear uh, your predictors are. Okay, so we, we, we're getting there, we're getting there. Oh, you're funny. <laughs> okay. So some of the problems that are, are associated with the assumptions, okay? The linear regression model or the multiple linear regression model has a couple of assumptions. Uh, one of the assumptions is that the, 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 the independent variables, they are independently distributed, okay? And they are uncorrelated within themselves. Another one of the assumption is that you have a uniform variance, okay? If you don't have a uniform variance, then uh, one of the assumptions is going to be violated, okay? It's, 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 not going to, 
if your model is not conforming to those assumptions. Okay, so let's talk about that one, which is number three, non-constant variance. One of the ways that you can uh, minimize that situation is with the transformation of the response variable. Okay, we're talking about the Y now. So as you can see here, when you plot the fetal values, right? The, you know, the, the white hats, and then the residuals within the white hats, you see that, uh, you know, as, as, the, as the observation progress, the variance is getting wider, okay? And you can see from the blue lines that the blue line starts with, uh, you know, with a minimum distance to the left, and then that distance grows to the right. In the right um, a plot visualization, you see a response log y. So if we transform that dependent variable and apply a, a logarithm, you know, a natural log, then you see that that increase uh, gets a little bit attenu attenuated, okay? So we are trying to fix that assumption using that transformation. It could be a log, it could be a square root, it could be uh, it could be a power, okay? So you have to uh, experiment with this to see if the transformation that you are applying is, you know, uh, minimizing the 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 problem of the non-constant variance. Also, another term for this is heteroscedasticity. Okay, it's a it's it's a, it's a long word. Okay, so I was just putting that in the chat. <laughs> that's like my right, favorite word. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a that's a that's a big one. Heteroscedasticity. Yes. Okay. Yep. And you see it in in various uh, situations. You see that uh, you know that phenomenon. Also, you know, in time series, when you, know, when you deal with time series, also you can see that phenomenon, and this is one of the ways to to deal with. Okay, another one that you are going to be confronted with is the outliers, right? The those abnormal uh, points that they, you know, they kind of, uh, you know, are out of the group, right? You know, you have a, a bunch of values that are kind of clustered, and then you have a point or two that are kind of, you know, out there. So one of the things that we have to decide really is what is the cause of that outlier? Because uh, we cannot knee jerk our actions to you know, just uh, remove them. It depends on what caused the outlier. If the outlier maybe is a problem of data collection or it's a problem of a faulty sensor, et cetera. But if not, then we have to, you know, we have to deal with that with that outlier. And there's some, you know, uh, methods uh, that we can, you know, we, we, can, we can deal with it. For example, there is a method for robust uh, regression that it doesn't get much affected, you know, by the presence of outlier. So there are ways, you know, to deal with it. But one of the things that it should pop, you know, in your minds is what is causing that outlier, you know, to make sure that we have the sufficient uh, know how of how that data set was uh, was produced and, and collected. Okay, another one is high leverage points, and you see, okay, but what is the difference between our liars, right, and these high leverage points? Well, it really depends on the location of those points relative to your regression. If you see the left plot, for example, you see that there are two points that they are kind of you know, that they are out of the main group of points that conform with the regression, right? 20 and 41. 20, because of the location, which is kind of in the center, it doesn't have a kind of a high leverage. It's not moving that, uh, that, uh, that slope is not moving to that point. So this one, maybe it's an outlier, but maybe it's not a high leverage point compared to this one, 41, because of the location, okay, of this 41 is trying to push the linear regression from the dotted line that is supposed to be the, the correct one to the red line, okay, this point on. And this one 
is, uh, is, is it could be problematic, okay? Because it's affecting your slope and it's, it's going to affect your regression, okay? okay? So it depends. It depends of, you know, the location of that outlier in response to the linear regression and also is in, in conjunction with the rest of the, of the, you know, of the observed, of the observed data. Okay. Now, uh, going to, to the question from, uh, question from Oluwafemi, Oluwafemi. Okay, good. Uh, he talked about va variance inflation factors. So, one of the issues that I presented, you know, first with the multiple linear regression is the multicollinearity. In other words, two or more of those predictors are highly correlated between themselves. So one of the things that you could do is let's say that, and and, and this is uh you know from a from a from a real data set. Let's say that you have a variable of the coordinates of a transaction. Okay, the latitude and the longitude, where the transaction was, uh, you know, was was made. So you have that, and also you have the merchant latitude and the merchant longitude. When you do a correlation between them, you see that the latitude of the transaction and the merchant latitude, they're basically one. In other words, they have the same formation. So one of the things that you can do is choose only one variable of the two, only one variable, because they have the same formation. If you discard one, you're not going to be discarding new information. Okay, that's one way to deal with it, okay? The other way is to try to combine, putting interactions between those two variables to try to create a new feature. Also, you can you know, transform them. Okay, you can transform one of the features to see if the collinearity decreases, the correlation, the correlation decreases. All right, so there are different ways to deal with the multicollinearity issue. And the way that you can detect it is by using the formula for the variance inflation factor, which is given uh, in, the, in the text. And what it's doing is using the R square, the R square between the predictors. That's the correlation uh, index from the predictors. So as you can see, if the correlation, right, is really high for the S square, let's say that is 0 0.9. When you subtract it with one, you're going to get 0 0.1, right? One divided by 0 0.1 is going to be 10. So usually a variance inflation factor or greater than five, okay, which is associated with a correlation of 80, 80%, that's going to mean that those predictors are highly, highly, highly collated, all right? And you have to decide which method you are going to do to, uh, uh, to deal with them, all right? So going back, right, to the questions that we had for the advertising. So regarding the relationship between advertising budget and sales between TV, uh, radio, and, uh, and, and newspaper, okay? Uh, how do you, you know, model that? Well, you can use multiple regression. You can use single, you know, regression between each of, of them, as I show you in the, in the plot. And also you can look at the F statistic. What happens when we combine those predictors in one model versus modeling uh, in, uh, uh, you know, separate, okay? The F statistic is going to give you the, the answer. How strong is the relationship? Well, you're going to use the R square, right? And also you can use the residual standard error. Which media are associated with sales, okay? Uh, here, you can use some p-values. Uh, one of the things that I was discussing uh, this, this, uh, this weekend is that uh, psyche learning Python uh, they don't they don't give you p values. Okay, you have to calculate it uh, on on your own. But the stats model, which is modeled on the base R, you know, functions of LM, GLM, etc., the stats model really gives you the p values. And what is the p value? The mystery of the p value, right? Well, the p values. What it's going to tell you is 
how probable the estimate the beta uh, not uh, had or the beta one had, how probable is that estimated could be equal to zero? Okay, that's what the p-value you know really tells you. If the p-value is very small, that means that the probability of that estimate to be zero is very small too. If it's very large, okay, let's say more than 0 0.05, then there's a chance that that estimate will be zero. And if it's zero, then it's not significant, okay? So that's basically the mystery of the, the p-value. <laughs> so how large is the, is the association between each medium and sales? Well, you're going to use some confidence intervals here, okay? For your, your estimates, for your constant, and for your uh, predictors. How accurately can you predict future sales? Well, uh, it depends, okay? Depends on the confidence intervals. The narrower the confidence intervals are, the better the model can, you know, can, can, can predict, right? Uh, is the relationship linear? Well, you have to use some residual plots to see if the relationship between TV and sales, uh, radio and sales, and newspaper and sales, are they linear or not? All right, and is there synergy among the advertising media? Uh, you have to, you know, try to experiment with some interactions uh, terms. For example, what happens when I combine TV and radio? Okay, so we can experiment with that interaction or radio and newspaper, etc. In fact, you can model with the, those, you know, any possibility of interactions there. All right, so uh, the next one is the comparison. Uh, this one really, we should explore more what is the KNN first, okay, to try to make uh, you know, a, a, a knowledgeable comparison. Uh, the only thing that I can tell you here is that the KNN is a non-parametric. Linear regression, multiple regression are parametric models. They make assumptions that your data conforms to a Gaussian distribution, that they have uniform variance, that in the multiple linear regression, they are not, uh, uh, there's no collinearity involved with the predictors and so forth. In the KNN, uh, you don't have those assumptions, okay? So eventually when we go to KNN, then we can go back, come back and compare between the regression of our models in the advertising and the KNN model on advertising too, and see which one, you know, give us the best, uh, the best response, okay? One more thing, one more thing. We still have a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, we haven't talked too much about the intercept or what is called the constant. And I'm going to you know, add this in, in, the, in the notes in terms of how do you interpret uh, the constant? Sometimes it gives you some information, sometimes it won't give you, you, know, <laughs> so, you know, uh, valuable information. Okay, so the intercept is when x, x is zero, right? X is zero, you eliminate that beta one estimate and then you stay with the beta not for simple, simple regression. So let's say that you are, you collected a data from uh, 50 students, 50 observations of a certain college, and you are studying the relationship between the hours that the student, uh, invested to study for an exam, okay, for a test. So let's see that this is the equation that you reach, you know, applying the formulas, the minimization, et cetera. So let's say that hours is equal to zero. Then the intercept is going to be that when the students don't invest any, any time in studying for the exam, this is going to be, the the result okay or the expected result for that you know for that uh for that situation okay so here we have a meaningful uh data that you know the 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 x could be zero what happens when x cannot be zero okay and this is the other you know uh example let's say that you are studying uh the relationship between weight right, in pounds, and the height of a, of a person, okay? And you come up with this, uh, 
uh, regression formula. Okay, so what happens when pounds is zero? What happens when pound is zero? It would be. Let me put it another way. Can pounds be zero? No. In the real world? Right, no, right? So this one, uh, because it's not possible for X to be zero, then this number, it doesn't tell us anything. <laughs> the intercept, right? Okay. It's, you know That's when X is going to be zero. So you have a height of 22.3. But that's not possible, okay? So this one is what is called non-informative. It's a non-informative uh, parameter in the, in the equation. So you should be aware of that. For, for, for example, in the auto automobile uh, data set, where we have the horsepower and we have the miles per gallon, uh, the relation the regression formula is going to tell you that when Howard's power is zero, there's going to be an associated miles per gallon. But you have to interpret if horsepower can be zero. And probably not, because if it's a car, usually it has some horsepower, right? <laughs> okay. So that could be something that you have to be you know, uh, aware that sometimes the intercept, uh, you know, it won't tell you any new information about the relationship between the predictor and the response. Okay, and um, I guess that's it. <laughs>